two immigration officers and lecturer killed by suspected bandits in militia in Taraba State. Adamawa State Governor Amado Fintiri and Deputy Governor-elect receive certificates of return in Abuja. House of Representatives threatens to summon Attorney General of the Federation and other government officials over illegal sale of crude. And on the foreign scene, thousands of civilians flee Sudan's capital amidst the fifth day of fierce fighting that has led to at least 270 deaths. Good evening. This is the news at 7 on Western Spring Television. My name is Febi Olani Kwekun. I will begin with security, where two immigration officers have been killed by suspected bandits along the Takum Usa local government area link road in Taraba State. Confirming the incident, police public relations officer in the state, Abdullahi Usman, said the officers were not only shot dead, but had machete cuts on their bodies with their motorcycle abandoned. The officers were identified as inspectors Adik Austin and Uzo James of the Immigration Department attached to the USA local council checkpoint. Mr. Usman disclosed that their remains have been deposited at the morgue for autopsy for a full-scale investigation launched, adding that the killing of the immigration officers is not related to the ongoing Nicaragua's famous crisis in the area. In a related development, a lecturer with the Federal University of Wukari has been confirmed killed in his farmland by a suspected thief militia group. Until his death, the lecturer, Daniel Bala, worked with the university's Faculty of Agriculture. In a reprisal attack, the Irish youths of Wukari killed a thief businessman and injured his friend. In Benue's state, the police have arrested nine suspected cattle rustlers who allegedly conspired with some herders to cause killings in the state. It will be recalled that some communities in Otopo and Guma local government areas were attacked recently, leading to the loss of about 130 lives. As speaking while parading the suspects today, police public relations officer in the state, Katerina Nene, said the suspected rustlers conspired with criminal herders to rustle cows and share the proceeds, adding that such act fueled killings in the state. The PPRO listed items recovered from the suspects include one locally made pistol and four cows. Gunmen have kidnapped Daniel Ogoshi, a driver to Nasarawa State Deputy Governor Emmanuel Akabe. Reports say the driver was abducted from the residence of his friend in Lafia around 9.30 p.m. yesterday. His phone and car were left behind. Police public relations officer in the state, Rahman Ansel, said the police are on top of the matter. Media officer to the deputy governor, Chris Ahima, assured that the state government would do everything possible to secure the release of the kidnapped driver. And staying with security matters, Nigerian troops of Sector 3 Multinational Joint Task Force have rescued a seven-year-old girl Yakura Jalori, who was kidnapped by suspected Boko Haram and ISWAP terrorist. In a statement, MNJTF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Kamarudin Adegoke said the troops who were on a fighting patrol engaged the terrorist, killed three of them, and rescued the girl. He said the troops had reunited the kidnapped victim with her family. In another development, Lieutenant Colonel Adegoke revealed that troops intercepted one Aisha Muhammad with her seven children along Maiduguri Bonguno Road. Aisha is suspected to be the wife of one Mustafa, who is a tailor in a terrorist enclave at Tumbungini. Meanwhile, two persons were injured due to a grenade at explosion at Polatari IDP camp in Monguno. According to the MNJTF spokesman, a 13 year old boy, Adamu Muhammad, took a grenade charger home following which it exploded when he hit the grenade with a metal plate while playing. After the incident, troops cordoned off the area and the explosive ordnance team scanned and secured the area. The Nigerian Correctional Service says 3,298 inmates across custodial centers in Nigeria are on death row. Speaking with Nan, NCOS a Public Relations Officer Abubakar Umar also said the term condemned criminal has been repealed. 
Mr. Omar said the NCOS Act 2019, which redefined prisons as correctional centers, voided the term, stating that the service prefers to use the more friendly term, inmates on death row. He noted that death sentences are not always carried out immediately after they are imposed. He said the intervention of human rights groups who are against death sentences has also reduced the execution of offenders. And elsewhere, management of the Badon Electricity Distribution Company, IBDC Ocean Region, has signaled its readiness to curb energy theft occasioned by the influx and proliferation of illicit meters that threaten the growth of the company and its provision of quality service to customers. IBDC disclosed this today during a town hall themed illicit meters, where it revealed that the development has affected economy and the lives of residents. Emmanuel Ujadigele was at the meeting in our report. Oh, saw the attendance of the Ibadan Electricity Distribution Company, IBDC Top Brass, security agencies and customers, some of who registered their grievances during an interactive session. Speaking to newsmen at the venue of the meeting in Oshubo, the Oshun State Capital, Oshun Regional Head of the IBDC, Oluwato Yakinshoye, described it as timely. He noted that it will help raise awareness about the adverse effect of energy theft and warned that the company will spare no expense in prosecuting those found guilty of using illicit meters. But these illicit meters are gotten through the back door. We are up to now, we don't know. We, and these meters cannot vent on our network. That's why we call them illicit meters because they are not known to us. Uh, basically, most of them are these non STS meters. And then, as a company, we stopped the installation of non STS meters in 2013. So, every of these meters that was installed between 2013 till now, they are all illicit. Non STS meters, by that, would mean these meters that you have to use card before you can load. Mr. Akinsoye also promised that the company will look into reports of misbehavior by its staff and put other measures in place to increase service delivery and plug revenue loss. In our show region, conservatively, we have uh, about 15,000 of these meters in our network, illicit meters. And the average revenue loss every month due to this is over 130 million naira to us as a company. It's huge on our revenue. So if we can curb this illicit meter, then of course we know that we can plow back this revenue to, to our own post and we can use it to upgrade our network and do other interventions so we can serve our customers better. On his part, Deputy Commandant of the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps in Oshun, Vincent Linus, spoke glowingly of the synergy between the Corps and IBEDC. He added that there will be no secret cows or exemptions from the long arms of the law. We are not relenting in getting information from our undercovers and then we have also clamped on some people with heavy evidence of their subverting installations of uh, IBDC and then by next week hopefully many of them will be arraigned before court or competent jurisdiction. IBDC customers at the event including Mr. Michael Popola wants the company to take note of concerns and act accordingly. Now now, I want the IBDC to take note and take a proactive action on some questions the community and other members of the uh, state to take proactive action on it. I want them to go back to their table and make a resolution and make sure that they give us the best service. While the IBDC has declared its preparedness to deliver efficiently, its management insists that this can only happen if customers do not sabotage or shortchange the company. Emmanuel Ujadigili, Western Spring Television News. In other news, President Muhammadu Buhari says the court's judgment will or which ordered the reinstatement of Ifan Yararume as a non-executive chairman of the Nigeria National Petroleum Company, NNPC Limited, will be appealed. President Buhari had appointed Senator Ararume as non-executive board chairman of the national oil firm in September 2021, but was later sacked and replaced with Margaret Chuba Okadibu in January the following year. The former senator representing Emo North had sued the president, arguing that his sack was wrongful and amounted to disruption and interruption of the term of his office. In a judgment delivered yesterday, Justice Nyang Ekwo ordered that the former senator be reinstated as a non-executive chairman of the NNPC with all rights and privileges due to him. The court also set aside all decisions made by the board 
after the removal of Senator Rarume since January 2022 till date and awarded the sum of 5 billion naira as damages in his favor. But in a statement today, presidential spokesperson Femi Additional said steps have already been taken to appeal the verdict. The, National Independ the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, today issued certificates of return to Governor-elect of Kebi State, Nasir Idris, and the Deputy Governor-elect, Omar Abubakar. INEC National Commissioner in charge of Sokoto, Kebi, and Zamfara State, Professor Sani Kala, also issued certificates of return to 10 elected members of the State House of Assembly in last Saturday's supplementary elections. The State has 24 state constituencies, but INEC had on March 30th presented certificates of return to 14 winners of the March 18th House of Assembly poll in the state. Four out of the 24 House of Assembly members elect contested and won on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, while 20 others won on the platform of the All Progressives Congress, APC. Shortly after receiving the certificate, Mr. Idris lauded the Commission and security agencies for ensuring enabling environment for the electorate to exercise their civic responsibility. The governor-elect also thanked the electorate for ensuring a successful exercise and giving them the mandate to steer the affairs of the state. And as true believers, that time we have accepted what has happened in good faith as a true Muslim. And I know that if I throw KB people are the people that will cast their votes, they will definitely cast their vote on us. I have already made my position clear during our electioneering campaign. We have made our position to the people of Cape State. Cape State is being endowed with so many natural resources. And uh, God willing, when we came in, we will do everything humanly possible to ensure that we tap those natural resources for the benefit of our people. Agriculture is number one. Like Ray has said, that our state is in category A in terms of natural resources and agriculture. In a related development, Governor of Adamawa State, Hamadou Fintiri, and the Deputy Governor elect, Kaletapa Farauta, have received their certificates of return in Abuja. The Independent National Electoral Commission INEC presented a certificate to the newly re-elected governor and his new deputy today at its national headquarters. Governor Fintiri had yesterday emerged winner of a drama-filled supplementary election in Adamawa State. Governor Fintiri, the candidate of the People's Democratic Party PDP, polled 430,861 votes, defeating Aisha Tubinani Dahiru, of the All Progressives Congress APC, who got 398,738 votes. Gone through in the last one week, so that together as stakeholders, we will continue to build on the process, we will continue to build on our democracy to improve and deepen the democracy. Uh, one apology I have to make is what happened to the two excellent commissioners in my state. I take the blame and I hope to take apology for I'm sorry for what the hoodlums at the distance did for the mistaken identity that they thought they were who and they will never be. They are excellent gentlemen. I've never met them in person, but I cherish and I bear their good work. Uh, for Nigerians that have stood for this democracy and the international community, I say thank you. 
The president-elect, Bola Tinubu, has called on the police to investigate the Adamawa supplementary governorship election. Yesterday, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, declared Hamadou Fintiri winner of the election after collating the supplementary election results. Prior to the announcement, controversy ensued after the resident electoral commissioner in the state, Hudu Yunisa Ari, declared the candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Aisha Binani Dahiru, winner of the election. His declaration was subsequently voided by the electoral umpire. In our statement today, Senator Tinubu called for a thorough investigation of all that transpired in the election. The president-elect also congratulated winners in the supplementary elections across the country, calling on the elected officials to rededicate themselves to the service of their respective constituents. In the meantime, the minority caucus in the House of Representatives has killed the re-election of Governor Amadou Fintiri of Adamawa State as the triumph of the will of the people of the state. In a congratulatory message by the Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, Indidi Elumelu, the caucus commended the people of Adamawa for resilience and for standing with Governor Fintiri and resisting what it refers to as desperate anti-democratic forces. The House minority said from the results of the main election and the supplementary poll, it was clear that Governor Fintiri remains the clear choice of the people. The caucus added that the ultimate victory further proves that no matter how much falsehood, tyranny, or manipulations appear to thrive, the truth will always prevail at the end of the day. The caucus urged the governor of Interior to remain focused and continue in his excellent delivery of service, particularly his massive legacy infrastructural development project and empowerment of citizens for which the people of Adamawa State overwhelmingly re-elected him. In all your states, the government has vowed to prosecute those it referred to as undesirable elements that engage in recruitment fraud for the express purpose of defrauding the general public. A fictitious list making the rounds on social media claims the State Universal Basic Education Board has started a hiring process. However, in a statement today, the board chairman, Reni Adeniro, asked the public to exercise caution and avoid doing business with con artists posing as recruitment representatives for the UBE. According to him, management had started looking for people responsible for the fraudulent recruitment and will turn them in if they are apprehended. You're watching the news at 7 on Western Spring Television. Still to come, thousands of civilians flee Sudan's capital amidst a fifth day of fierce fighting that has led to at least 270 deaths. I'll bring you more on these while we return. James Ajibolaige was a lawyer who obtained his first degree in classics from Nigeria's premier university of Ibadan. Born September 13, 1930, the orator and the polygod spoke impeccable Say English, no French, Igbo, Hausa and Yoruba languages. His fine addiction placed him among classical orators and public speakers like Cicero, the Roman orator. This attribute earned him the prefix Cicero of Esauke. He offered the Kaduna Boy, an autobiography, Detainee's Diary, Constitution, and the People, among six other books. Bolaige was a colorful politician, elected governor of your state in 1979, and appointed a federal minister in 1999. He was a pioneer founder of Afeni Ferry, the Yoruba social, cultural, and political group. He invested his political sagacity to propel the group to the height of political leadership and decision making in the southwest of Nigeria. Bolaige was assassinated on the 23rd December 2001. His murderers are yet to be apprehended till today. Western Spring Television identifies Bolaige as a watershed character in history.
1914 Amalgamation Treaty is synonymous to the birth of Nigeria. Frederick Lugard, a British Army captain and an outlaw who struck gold in Africa became the instrument used by destiny to make it happen. The Amalgamation of Nigeria was designed for economic reasons by the colonial administration to offset Northern Protectorate budget deficit by Southern Protectorate surplus returns. The Amalgamation had ad issue created imbalance in the economic political structure of Nigeria and was responsible for the persistent hiccups in the efforts to forge a united country till today. Nigeria's amalgamation was labeled as the mistake of 1914 by native northern conservatives who neither wanted it nor contributed anything significant to its sustenance. Western Springer Television identifies with Amalgamation Treaty of 1914 as a watershed event in history. Nelson Rolly Hialahia Mandela was an anti-apartheid activist who gave his all for the elimination of what has been described as the world's most vicious rule of the unjust and man's inhumanity against man. He was born July 18, 1918 in Mveso, South Africa. Educated and trained as a successful legal practitioner, he took up the gauntlet of a human activist against segregation by the minority of whites through primitive in South Africa. At the climax of his trial for treason, orchestrated by the minority South African government, the great crusader for democratic equality was prepared to pay the supreme sacrifice to establish majority rule in his native land. He told white jurists that if achieving freedom for his people was worth his life, he was prepared to die. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in Robin Island, described as the most notorious prison in the world. It was from this same prison that he came out as a free man to assume office as South Africa's first black president in 1994. Western Spring Television identifies Nelson Mandela as a watershed character in history. Welcome back. This is still news at 7 on Western Spring Television. A reminder of our headlines. Two immigration officers and lecturer killed by suspected bandits in militia in Taraba State. Adamawa State Governor Amado Fintiri and Deputy Governor-elect receive a certificate of return in Abuja. The House of Representatives threatens to summon Attorney General of the Federation and other government officials over illegal sale of crude. On a foreign scene, thousands of civilians flee Sudan's capital amidst a fifth day of fierce fighting that has led to at least 270 deaths. Attorney General of the Federation Ababaka Malami and other government officials failed to appear before the House of Representatives at a committee today over alleged loss of $2.4 billion dollars from the legal sale of 48 million barrels of crude. The committee chairman, Mark Wheeler, stated this after the invited parties failed to honor last week's invitation of the committee. The other committee said it is given one last opportunity to Mr. Malami, Minister of Finance, Zainab Hamad, and Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Mefiele, to appear before the committee and speak on inflows from recoveries from whistleblowers. The lawmakers said the AGF and the finance minister have failed to respond to any correspondence from the committee. According to the chairman of the committee, documents from the accountant general showed that payments have been made to whistleblowers, but no evidence to show that these monies were expended in accordance with the relevant laws. The committee said if the government officials fail to honor the invitation this time, they will be summoned and further statutory powers will be exercised. Operatives of the finan Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, have arrested six suspected internet fraudsters in Abuja. A statement by the agency says suspects were arrested in an early morning sting operation 
Ajahi and Dawaki areas of the FCT. The commission gave the names of the suspects as Emmanuel Indibusi, Solomon Tochuku, Okotie Kingsley, Benedict Ako, Samuel Anosike, and Samson Ife. Items recovered from, the, from them include three vehicles, laptops, mobile phones, one international passport, and an expensive wristwatch. EFCC says the suspects will be charged to court as soon as the investigation is concluded. And in Lagos State, the governorship election petitions tribunal has granted leave to the PDP gubernatorial candidate Aziz Adedino for a substituted service of an election petition on Governor Babajide Sonwolu. The tribunal also granted that Mr. Adedino should do the same for Labour Party's gubernatorial candidate for the state, Badeba Rhodes Viva. Mr. Adedino and his party had, through their counsel, Austin Akumreta, told the tribunal that they were unable to effect personal service of the petition on the respondent. In the petition, Mr. Adediran and PDP claimed that Governor Sonwolu and his deputy, Abafemi Hamzat, were at the time of election not qualified to contest. He also submitted that Mr. Rhodes Viva was at the time of the election also not qualified to contest. The PDP governorship candidate called for their disqualification in the election for non-compliance with the Electoral Act 2022 and INEX guidelines. And the Lagos State Traffic Management Authority, LASMA, has confirmed the death of an unnamed commercial bus driver. Also, others suffered injuries in an accident between government-owned bus rapid transport BRT and a commercial vehicle. LASMA tweeted that the accident occurred at Ifako in Wat Ogudu Bridge. In a video clip shared on LASMA's Twitter account, the yellow commercial bus, popularly known as Danfo, appeared to have flipped over after clashing with a BRT vehicle. The BRT bus went up in flames, compounding the traffic situation along the axis. Survivors were seen sitting on the pedestrian footpath while the LASMA officials were coordinating traffic. LASMA spokesman Adebayo Taufik blamed the accident on overspeeding by the buses. The management of Ladoke Akintola University of Technology Lautech Ogomosho in Oyo State has banned students from driving or bringing cars to the campus. The institution also banned tinted vehicles being used by staff members and students while learner permits must be placed on vehicles of beginner drivers. A memo issued by the registrar of the institution, Kayo Diogunle, said the decision was reached at a management meeting held today. The registrar also said unauthorized vehicles parked at various locations in the university should be taken out with immediate effect. President Muhammad Buhari has returned to Abuja after an eight-day official visit to Saudi Arabia, where he also performed the lesser Hajj, a religious pilgrimage for Muslims. President Buhari departed Saudi Arabia via King Abdulaziz International Airport in Jeddah today. And according to reports, Saudi government officials, traditional and spiritual leaders from Nigeria, as well as some senior staff of the Nigerian embassy in the kingdom, were at the airport to bid him farewell. Last Thursday, the president performed Umrah rituals amidst tight security at a Grand Mosque in Makkah. He also visited some historical religious places in Medina on Tuesday and Wednesday before proceeding to Makkah for the Umrah. Also while in Makkah, President Buhari hosted some traditional and religious leaders for the Iftar. The federal government has declared Friday, April 21st and Monday, April 24th, 2023 as public holidays to mark this year's Idel Fitri celebration. Minister of Interior Rauf Aregbe made a declaration on behalf of the federal government, according to statements by the permanent secretary, Shoaib Belgore. He congratulated all Muslims for the successful completion of the holy month of Ramadan. Mr. Aregbe called on all Muslims to imbibe and practice the virtues of kindness, love, tolerance, peace, self-denial, sacrifice, and good neighborliness as exemplified by the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Now, the foreign scene, thousands of civilians have fled Sudan's capital and foreign nations are trying to evacuate their citizens 
amidst a 50 day of fierce fighting that has led to the deaths of at least 270 people. Witnesses reported people leaving Khartoum in cars and on foot as gunfire and deafening explosions rocked the city. And while officials in Japan and Tanzania say they are considering missions to evacuate their citizens, the exodus follows Tuesday's collapsed ceasefire between the warring factions. The Sudanese military and the paramilitary rapid support forces had agreed a 24-hour humanitarian ceasefire on Tuesday, but the truce collapsed within minutes of its proposed launch. A new ceasefire has now been put forward by the RSF, but the army has yet to commit to the proposal. Heavy gunfire and explosions could still be heard in the capital, Khartoum, despite a 24-hour humanitarian ceasefire that was to take effect late on Tuesday. The ceasefire did not materialize, with residents in the capital reporting heavy gunfire and explosions for the fifth day running. The African Union is hoping a pause in the clashes on Wednesday will allow a delegation from Djibouti, Kenya and South Sudan to arrive for talks with Sudan's de facto leader, General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and his rival Mohamed Hamdan Dagolu, who commands the RSF. So far, international mediation efforts have failed and there are growing concerns the country could slide into a civil war. Nearly 200 people have been killed and hundreds of others injured with the main doctors' union warning that the number of dead could rise even further. Residents in and around Khartoum have reported anti-aircraft fire and airstrikes that shook buildings. In western Sudan too, the UN said fighting was raging. A school teacher in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, has told the BBC that one of his pupils was shot in the head by a stray bullet amid continued fighting in the country. He further said food supply were getting scars every day as shops and supermarkets remain closed, adding that electricity is stable but could go off any moment. Meanwhile, Japan is planning to send a military aircraft to evacuate its citizens from Sudan amid the deadly fighting. Japanese government spokesman Hirokazu Matsuno said as of Wednesday there were 60 Japanese nationals stuck in Sudan. He said the government would do its utmost to ensure the safety of Japanese residents in Sudan, including the safety and evacuation of Japanese nationals, in close cooperation with the G7 and other major countries. In the same vein, the president of the National Association of Nigerian Students in Europe, NANS, Bashir Saidu Mohammed, has called on the federal government of Nigeria to not only protect Nigerian students in Sudan, but also evacuate them amid conflict in the North African country. Muhammad, who was reacting to the student's interview with the BBC Tuesday morning, said it is necessary for the government to act fast to avoid subjecting the students to danger. He reiterated that it is the responsibility of government to protect and ensure the safety of Nigerian students, both at home and abroad, asking the federal government to strictly act in that regard. A Sudanese doctors' union has said in a statement that 39 out of 59 hospitals in Khartoum and nearby states are out of service, highlighting the worsening humanitarian situation in the country. The Central Committee of Sudanese Doctors said Wednesday morning that only 20 hospitals are fully or partially operational, further explaining that among the hospitals that have stopped working, there are nine hospitals that were bombed and 16 hospitals that were subjected to forced evacuation. Western Spring Television News. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has urged unionist politicians as Tommons to get power sharing up and running again. Mr. Sunak gave the closing speech at a three day event at Queen's University, Belfast, marking the Good Friday Agreement's 25th anniversary. He called it a profound concern that power sharing had not been in place for nine of those years. He hails the agreement as an extraordinary political achievement. Other current and former world leaders also addressed the conference today. Amongst them were former U.S. President Bill Clinton and Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar. The Friday Agreement will always be remembered as one of the most extraordinary political achievements of our lifetimes. Because step by step, faltering at first, people on all sides began to do things that were once unthinkable in the search for peace. But you don't need me to tell you that, because many of you in this room created it. It's humbling to be with you today, and with the people of Northern Ireland, who have endured so much. 
after three long decades where violence and terror were part of everyday life. A generation has grown up in a place that is vastly more peaceful, more prosperous, and more at ease with itself. Now, of course, we meet here today in circumstances that are far from perfect. But my argument today is this. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement remains the best and only foundation for peace and prosperity. If Seamus Heaney were still alive and he were here, he would say, we walked on air against our better judgment. Now you have a hard floor to walk on. For God's sakes, get up and walk. <laughs> This whole thing has been one of the great blessings of my life. And I can't wait to see what you do with it. God bless you. Thank you. In the meantime, Russia aligned hackers are seeking to disrupt or destroy Britain's critical infrastructure. British Cabinet Office Minister Oliver Dowden said in a speech today that the groups have started to focus on the UK in recent months. The head of the National Cyber Security Centre warned that the UK is not doing enough to protect its infrastructure from cyber threats. The NCSC also issued an official threat alert to critical businesses. Officials are recommending that organisations such as those behind the UK's energy and water supplies act now to protect themselves against the emerging cyber threats. Meanwhile, cybercrime is estimated to cost the UK billions of pounds each year. According to new figures published today, 32% of UK businesses and charities suffered a cyber breach or attack in the past year. That is a third of our businesses. And ransomware continues to run rampant. And as, Prime Minister, as President Biden rightly recognised a few weeks ago, Thanks to its scale and its impact, ransomware is no longer just a crime. It's a national security threat. And our response needs to reflect the severity of that threat. These are attacks on our citizens, our businesses, and our democracy. They are an attempt to undermine our society. And we are determined to stop them with your help. In the UK, we grasped the need for urgent action early. And we've been doing a lot over the past few years to strengthen our cyber defences. We have published the National Cyber Strategy. And we have a new and effective cyber sanctions regime, which we recently used for the first time against a group of Russian cyber criminals as part of a joint campaign with the United States. And we are working closely with international partners to tackle the proliferation of sophisticated commercial cyber tools. At the same time, the government itself continues to face a range of attacks, including ransomware and espionage. And so we are constantly looking to strengthen our cyber defences. And still ahead, Netflix says its long-promised crackdown on password sharing will begin in the coming months. We have more on these and other business stories after this break. Please do stay with us. The British Empire was the largest and the most powerful in the world. At its zenith, the empire embraced a quarter of the earth land surface and imposed her imperial majesty's rule on more than 458 million peoples across nations and continents. The empire took off with overseas possessions and trading posts established by England, spread over 3 million kilometers between 16th and early 18th century. Like previous empires, Empires. The British Empire began to crumble on its weight of overstretched territories and growing unrest in our various colonies. Today, the British Empire no longer exists. What is in place is the Commonwealth of Nations, a loose association of sovereign states which recognize the King of England as the titular head. 
Western Spring Television identifies the British Empire as a watershed empire in history. Ahmadu Bello, a prince royal, was born the 6th of December 1910 at Rabba village, Sokoto, North Western Nigeria. His father was a district head and heir apparent to the Sultanate throne from the house of Osmano Danfodio, a religious and social reformer who brought the Haba dynasty under the Fulani Caliphate in the beginning of the 19th century. Ahmadu Bello raised the bar of political consciousness and participation when, in 1944, he engineered the establishment of the Northern People's Congress NPC as the first political party in Northern Nigeria and the rallying point for politicians in the region before independence. History will not forget Ahmadu Bello for his charisma and political sagacity which provided easy passage for his kinsmen to assume political and administrative positions in Nigeria's post-independence era. The distinguished elder statesman and Sadaun of Sokoto has his face on his country's 200 naira currency as a mark of honor to one of the architects of Nigeria's independence. Western Spring Television identifies Ahmadu Bello as a watershed character in history. Jeremiah Oyeni Obafemi on March 6, 1905. Obafemi Awulowo was a prime architect of Nigeria's independence and most consummate advocate of free education and social welfare in Africa's most populous nation. Erudite politician, thinker, and philosopher, Awo was fondly addressed by associates and political colleagues, brought his unique attributes to bear on governance in the defunct Western region. He administered as leader of government business and the premier between 1955 and 1958. Obafemi Awolo's premiership witnessed pioneering in the multi-sectoral policy initiatives and execution. The Western region under his administration paraded several enviable records. First television station in Africa, first real estate in Nigeria, first high-rise building in Nigeria, first modern sports stadium in Nigeria, first agricultural settlement in Nigeria, first modern civil service secretariat in Nigeria, and first industrial estate in Nigeria. His face is on 100 Naira denomination as a mark of honor for his distinguished services to his country. Western Spring Television identifies Obafemi Awulowo as a major character in history. Welcome back. And now to business. Managing Director of Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria, Osagi Okumbo, says the company detected and removed 460 illegal connections on the Trans-Niger pipeline before resuming operations after a one-year shutdown. The TNP, operated by SPDC, is a major pipeline capable of transporting about 180,000 barrels of crude per day to the Boni Export Terminal. Speaking at the 2023 Nigeria International Energy Summit in Abuja, Mr. Akumbo said the TNP remained shut for one year due to the massive crude oil theft on the pipeline. He asked the incoming administration to prioritize the security of oil infrastructure. He said Nigeria was not short of frameworks and written documents on how to tackle the various challenges in the oil sector. Mr. Okumbo noted that the decade of gas document, for example, include steps to deepen gas use, but implementation remained a challenge. Netflix says its long promise to crack down on password sharing will begin in the coming months. A streaming giant plans to stop people in the same household from sharing account details by the end of July. The move aimed at boosting subscribers has been trialed in some countries. It comes as the company announced it would shut down the DVD rental service that launched the firm 25 years ago. The crackdown and password sharing will come later, the, later than originally announced, but the company told investors it had found opportunities to improve the experience for members. Users of standard or premium plans can however pay to share a password with up to two extra people outside their household. 
In South Africa, inflation edged higher in March with food prices recording their highest year-on-year -year jump in more than a decade. In a statement, the National Statistics Agency said inflation for food and non-alcoholic beverages continues to accelerate or is up 14% when compared to March last year. Overall, consumer inflation rose to 7.1% last month, from 7.0% in February and 6.9% in January. In a bid to rein in soaring costs, the central bank sharply raised its main interest rate to 7.75% last month. And while UK inflation slowed last month but remained above 10% due to soaring food prices, further fueling a cost of living crisis despite a series of aggressive interest rate hikes, the Office for National Statistics said in a statement that the consumer price index rose by stronger than expected 10.1% in March from 10.4% in February. Inflation remained in double figures and surge in food and housing costs, dashing expectations for a drop below 10% after the Bank of England sharply raised borrowing costs. However, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said he was still confident that inflation would fall sharply by the end of the year. Well, this is a small headline fall, but it disguises a large rise in food inflation, which is causing pressure to families up and down the country as they see their cost of their weekly food shop go up. And it shows that there is no such thing as an automatic fall in the headline rate of inflation. That's why we have a plan. And if we're going to reduce that pressure on families, it's absolutely essential that we stick to that plan and we see it through so that we halve inflation this year, as the Prime Minister has promised. We have to watch that carefully, but it's important to say, although our core inflation is marginally higher than other countries, Germany, for example, has higher food price inflation than we have. So this is a common problem that we're all facing. And when I talk to my colleagues at the International Monetary Fund, everyone is very clear that the UK is on the right track uh, to focus on bringing down inflation. And if we do that, we can get through this very difficult period and make sure that we're not having the same discussion this time next year um, and that we can get back to growth, which is what we want to see. In sports, Nigeria forward Terem Morphy has been nominated for the League One Best African Player of the Season Award. 23-year-old Morphy was nominated following his impressive displays in the French top flight for Lorient and Nice this season. The Nigeria International linked up with Nice from Lorient in January and he has scored 19 goals in 29 league appearances this season. Morphy is nominated along with 10 other players including Akraf Hakimi, Mama Balde, Habib Diallo, and Hamari Traore, amongst others. Victor Osimen picked up the individual award named after former Cameroon international Mark Vivian Foy in the 2019-2020 season. Pep Guardiola is determined not to allow Manchester City's past failures to weigh them down as they chase long-awaited Champions League glory. City appear to have one foot in the semi-finals for a third successive year after beating Bayern Munich 3-0 in the first leg of their quarter-final last week. They will be expected to complete the job against the Germans in the return leg at the Alliance Arena tonight. The challenge will then be to take the next steps required to finally win the trophy for the first time after previous frustrating defeats against Tottenham, Lyon, Chelsea and Real Madrid. Pep, Thomas Tuchel uh, has just said that it'll take a miracle for Bayern Munich to go through. I get the sense that you don't really believe in miracles in sport. How do you control miracles? I've been here in Bayern Munich and I know the mentality of this club. It's in everywhere. In the seven Strasse is in, uh, in the skin. And I know what they believe they can do it. We believe too. But... So, when you are in this type of clubs, and we are going to try to build this feeling that whatever happened, we can do it, uh, like they have for the history they had in they have in the past in this competition, and we are growing with that. So, um, this is what it is. 
In the meantime, Marcus Rashford has returned to training for Manchester United before tomorrow's Europa League quarterfinal second leg in Sevilla. The 25-year-old has not played since he sustained a groin injury during United's home Premier League win against Everton on the 8th of April. Luke Shaw, Marcel Sabitza and Tyrell Malasia also trained at Carrington today. Rashford was unavailable for the first leg against Sevilla at Old Trafford, which United drew 2-2, as well as Sunday's 2-0 win at Pontenham Forest. However, Bruno Fernandes is out of the Sevilla trip for the Portugal midfielder serving a one-match suspension. PSG superstar Neymar and his girlfriend Bruna Biacandi have announced they are expecting their first child together. Brazilian footballer and the influencer shared a joint post via their respective Instagram accounts today to share the news with their fans. The couple shared a series of photographs showing Bronner's blossoming baby bum as Neymar sweetly cradled and kissed her stomach. The couple also sparked engagement rumors with the post as Bruna was seen wearing a stunning silver band on her left on her ring finger. The Neymar is already a father to a 12-year-old boy, Davi Luca, who he shares with his else girlfriend, Carolina Dantas. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, here is a recap of our major stories. Two immigration officers and a lecturer have been killed by suspected bandits and militia in fresh attacks in Taraba State. Governor of Adamawa State, Amadou Fintiri, and the Deputy Governor-elect Kaletapwa Farauta have received their certificates of return in Abuja. Attorney General of the Federation of Abaka Malami and other government officials failed to appear before the House of Representatives at a committee today over alleged loss of $2.4 billion from the illegal sale of 48 million barrels of crude. And on the foreign scene, thousands of civilians have fled Sudan's capital and foreign nations are trying to evacuate their citizens amidst a fifth day of fierce fighting that has led to the deaths of at least 270 people. Please do follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Western Spring Television. You can also watch us live on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. My name is Femi Olani Pekun. Good evening.